Dr. Stephen Cook is a technical fellow in the Northrop Grumman Office of Independent Airworthiness. He is the chair of the task group on autonomy design and operations in aviation. And as if that's not enough, he also leads the airworthiness subcommittee for F-38 on unmanned aircraft systems. So I will turn it over to you, Dr. Cook. Thank you so much, Kimberly. Uh, welcome everyone. I really appreciate you joining this breakout room. I'm going to talk for about eight to 10 minutes on what we're doing in ASTM on autonomy. And then we can open it up and have some, some discussion, answer your questions. Um, if you go to the second so slide, please. The, um, so the, the benefits of autonomy to aviation, um, you know, both civil and military folks have, have looked at this hard and have come to the conclusion that um, it really is going to benefit folks. The recent National Academies report on unmanned aircraft systems and incorporating them into the, to, into the national airspace system talked about the safety benefits of autonomy and looking at um, using autonomy in the complex environments and the advantage of processing speed and AI and things like that to respond to novel unanticipated situations. The Defense Department, Defense Science Board has, has looked at this and said, you know, autonomy has huge mission benefits and it can really uh, speed the, the, you know, deliver speed to the warfighter in being able to accomplish new missions. So a lot of, a lot of benefits to autonomy. So ASTM, going to slide three, ASTM is a standards development organization and it's one of many standards development organizations that the FAA uses as consensus standards to meet Part 23 requirements. So if you've been tuned in earlier in the week, we've talked a lot with different FAA and Air Force folks about using um, Part 23 as our way forward for certification. And ASTM standards come right in under that and provide to um, uh, provide a way for saying industry says this is what we believe is good enough in terms of consensus standards in terms of a means of compliance. So within ASTM we have four committees that work on different segments of the aviation marketplace. We have F-37 that worked on work on light sport aircraft, F-38 that works on unmanned aircraft systems, F-39 that works on aircraft systems like avionics, systems that can be used in multiple places and F-44 is, uh, is, is used for general aviation. So our, our group AC-377 um, works across all four of these. We don't write standards but what we do is we try and harmonize the way that the committees look at autonomy so we can reuse standards across the four. So one thing we were talking about at the beginning of the call is detect and avoid. F-38 uh, is, is coming out, we'll be publishing next month a, a standard on detect and avoid systems for unmanned aircraft systems. So for those uh, detect and avoid applications, wouldn't it be nice to be able to use that technology on light sport aircraft or on general aviation aircraft to improve the way that pilots can see and avoid other aircraft systems. So that's what we, we wanna do, and we're focusing on four areas. Uh, first of all, terminology. So when we say something in one standard, it means the same thing in, in another committee. Uh, requirements framework for certification. How, uh, how high is the chinning bar for proving out the technology that we're proposing? The design pillars of autonomy. What are the technical foundations that we need for any type of uh, automated system in aviation. And finally, regulatory barriers. Where do the current code of federal regulations prohibit things that we might want to do with autonomy and automated systems, then it's just not gonna let us do because of the way they're written. So we're looking at all four of those areas. Next. So our, our first, the first two categories on terminology and requirements framework, we actually have published a, a technical report that goes through, defines 51 terms related to aviation autonomy. Where possible, we, we um, drew from existing sources. 
Um, we also made a recommendation. We looked hard at what the automotive folks have used for levels of autonomy. Um, and we said, you know, hey, could we just adapt those to aviation? And we determined that it was very difficult to do that. And the reason is, is because, well, one of the main reasons is, is because some of the things that are unique to aviation, like air traffic control, we just don't find in the automotive industry. And it adds a level of complexity that makes levels of autonomy very difficult to, to talk about in a, in a really neat sense. Um, finally, we also provide sample decomposition. So one of the things we ask ourselves is, what does the human bring to the equation um, right now? What does the manned pilot bring to the aviation safety equation? And how would you decompose those functions and start to look at automating them? And what would that mean? So that's what this technical report does that, that's published. And there's a link down there if you want to go, go check that out. Next. Um, in specific regards to the requirements framework, um, you know, we're asking some fundamental questions. You know, what is the intended function that's being automated? What are the roles of the human and the machine in performing them? And what happens in those off nominal conditions when th things go sideways? Um, and so we take those decomposed functions that the human brings to the equation for aviation, we decompose them, and then we ask those questions. If you go to the next slide, and we first identify them and then we put them through three sets of filters. And the first filter is um, what is the balance, uh, what is the trade-off between a human doing it and the machine doing it? So what are the risks and benefits? So instead of looking at it from a pure, um, what's, the, what's the worst thing that could go wrong and trying to design the means of compliance in that way, we look at it as what might go right because we have automation on the system and then what may go wrong and we balance those out. Um, the second thing is, you know, what is the, what are we asking the human to do with the automation on board? So it's not that we've necessarily replaced the pilot, um, but maybe we're asking the pilot to perform a different role. Maybe it's a monitoring role versus a, an actuation role, in which case, that pilot responsibility now changes and we need to make sure that the interface between the pilot and the machine is solid and good and, and everyone understands what the role is. And then, and then finally, um, what's the maturity of the technology that's being, that's being uh, leveraged for this automation? Is it, um, is it something that's been around for a long time and has been proven out or is it something that's brand new? And from going through these three filters, we then can come up with tailorable requirements and means of compliance for the technology that we want to implement on the aircraft system. So that's, uh, that's what we suggest as far as a requirements framework to get us to what levels of certification are gonna be needed for automation and autonomy in, in, uh, in our standards. Next slide. We talked about developmental pillars of, of increased autonomy. So what are the foundational technologies that can safely enable autonomy in aviation? So we looked in three buckets. We looked at uh, the design architecture of the system. We looked at the development process, the testing, the, um, the requirements tracing, all the things that have to be done in developing a product. And we looked at the functionality. And we came up with six different pillars of, of, the, um, of increased autonomy. So we came up with the uh, development assurance. So how much assurance, how much testing, how much requirements tracing, static code coverage, dynamic code coverage do you put into your development of, of your software and your hardware system? Um, that's certainly a pillar that we have to, we have to look at. What's the role of the operations and that human role that I talked about in light of the automation? Dynamic consistency checking. So looking at the inputs that the automation is receiving and asking, is this a logical input? If I was just at um, 180 knots and now my sensor says I'm at 18,000 knots, that's not even possible. So that sensor's obviously got to be wrong and I've got to do something about it. 
uh, the the uh, uh, partitioning and modularity, uh, looking at the right ways of separating components, not just from a complexity standpoint, but also from a cost standpoint, and being able to replace things and upgrade things quickly. Uh, runtime assurance, making sure that there might be a bound to the autonomy, putting uh, basically training wheels around the autonomy that if things start going south, there's a backup system that prevents uh, anything catastrophic from happening. And um, fail functionality and, and redundancy, um, making sure that best practices that have been learned over the years in aviation are being followed. We really did this for, for three different reasons. One is, is that um, you know, we wanted our, all of our standards committees to address these six things in any standard that they produce dealing with automation and autonomy. Um, we also realized that there's a lot of new entrants into aviation that maybe aren't aware of some of the lessons learned that have um, you know, taken place in both the military and civilian side over the years. And we wanted to get just a short primer available for them to have. And then finally, um, a lot of these lessons are being forgotten because the workforce is aging. So we want to make sure that we have a document that captures some of these key points. And that technical report will be coming out this summer. Next. And the last thing I'll talk about is regulatory barrier analysis. So we looked at the Part 91. We looked at 3,171 lines of the Part 91. Uh, Dave Stevens and Anna Dietrich led, led this, are, are leading this effort. It's currently going on, and we put them into four buckets. Is it, a, is it a large barrier? Is it something that needs tweaking? Is it something that's just gonna slow the process, or is there no conflict? And the good news is, is that our largest category here is no conflict, um, but we also did find some things that, um, that are barriers and, and do need tweaking in terms of definitions um, in terms of the role of the pilot in command and things like that. And so we're gonna have to work with our colleagues in the FAA to understand um, how, how these uh, rules can be interpreted um, in light of the increased automation that's being proposed. And last slide. So my get off the stage here, just, you know, autonomy has huge potential to increase safety, improve mission performance, Obviously, we're here this week, and it's one of the main things that we've been talking about all week. Um, so it's got tremendous promise. Um, we think that aviation standards committees like ASTM, there's also RTCA, SAE, IEEE, others, um, by producing these consensus standards to support Part 23 or Part 21 type certification, um, this is the way to do it through uh, consensus standards that can keep up with the technology. Um, we think common terminology and harmonized requirements framework are essential to producing the standards. We have um, also think that having a good community appreciation of lessons learned and pillars of autonomy are really important. And finally, we're looking at those regulatory barriers. So, um, you know, together we can move forward and, and take, take, thing, take aviation to the next age of autonomy. And with that, I'll be happy to take any questions you have. Okay, great. We've got questions. <laughs> All right. Um, okay, so let's start with um, James asks, how deep do we want to go with the monitor versus pilot approach? Will there be regulatory barriers to prevent manual Mavericks from running amok among the automated self deconflicting aircraft? Yeah, that's a great question. And I don't, I don't know about the future. What, what I would say is, is in terms of the the monitoring um, approach, you know, that's, in fact, Carl's gonna be talking about that here in just a few minutes, um, if you'll tune into that from the simplified vehicle operations. But, you know, some of the things that, that we, I think we do wanna encourage is that, um, you know, one of the reasons our general aviation industry is in trouble is because of the uh, certification requirements for pilots and, and becoming, um, you know, skilled aviators, and I think certainly there's a place for that. Um, but I also think that making uh, making it easier, uh, making it more foolproof, and more—I uh, mean, human human error is still a leading causes of leading cause of accident in aviation. 
So anything we can do, I think, to um, either provide situation awareness to a pilot or even take over um, the pilot controls is big. I'll just give you one quick example. So F-16, the automated ground collision avoidance system won the Collier Trophy this year. Um, you know, that's something when the pilot is incapacitated, the, the system senses that, takes over the airplane, um, gets it to a point until the pilot's able to recover. Um, so far, they have nine saves to their credit. So that's nine people's lives have been saved because of this automation. So I think there's still really good potential there for, for a monitoring approach. Great. And then how much coordination is there between the ASTM committee and the DOD realm of autonomy in areas where it makes sense? Um, and are there specific areas? Yeah, there, there are a few. So um, Frank Delsing, who was on uh, earlier this week, I think he was on on Tuesday. Uh, he gave the Air Force airworthiness. Frank and his shop up there in, uh, in Dayton, Ohio, you know, played a major role in developing the ASTM standard 3269, which talks about uh, bounding complex systems. And so um, that's an area where uh, ASTM and the, and the Air Force collaborated on approach, looking at using a runtime assurance uh, process for doing some really advanced uh, AI and autonomy uh, certification. So um, certainly we would like more of that. Um, I, I work for a, a large defense contractor and we do a lot with the military. Um, we use Mill Handbook 516 for certification and that has a lot of ASTM standards and RTCA standards in it. So there's a lot of opportunity there we, we can take advantage of. Great. And then the, uh, Frank is actually here. So good. Hey, time. Frank. Great. <laughs> um, and is there an open source direction for autonomy? Uh, say more on that. O open source meaning like uh, open source code or? Uh, this is Bradley. I'm not, Bradley, can you chat something? Or maybe we'll move on to another one. Okay. Well, I mean, I think, I think there's, there's, um, you know, on, on the on the open source. Sorry, was there more comments? Yeah, he said countermeasures. Um, yeah, I don't. I'm not. Okay, Frank. Yeah. Frank just chimed in. And says we're actually up to ten saves on F-16. Yeah, so congratulations great. on that. On that, Frank. Okay, there is a burning question around whether it's um, there is a free version of the autonomy design and operations in aviation. Do you happen to know? Oh, is there a free version? Um, <laughs> I I think I I I think that the uh, the real answer is that it's a copyrighted publication, and so whatever ASTM decides on that is, is the rules we go by. So if you'll go to the ASTM website, um, if it's, I haven't been there in a long time, but if whatever the, the rule is there is, is what we have to abide by. Right. And is there, a, is, um, or how do you see LEO satellites being utilized for autonomy of UAM industry? And then we'll end with this one. That I, I don't know. Um, I'm, Okay. I mean, certainly communication and uh, knowing where things are and knowing the status of our aircraft is going to be a huge factor in, uh, in enabling this technology, but I am not a, a satellite person, right. so I can't really answer that. Okay, great. Okay, so that brings us to conclusion here. So um, Dr. Cook will stay here, and then everyone else can go back to agilityprime.com and choose a different room uh, in the the speakers are posted in the in the video player as well, so you can see and choose your rooms wisely. Thanks for joining everyone. So without any more delay, I'll turn it over to you. All right, thanks. Um, appreciate it. I see that I already have some friends in here uh, ready with some tomatoes. So we'll, uh, I'll do the best I can. Um, the, uh, so welcome everyone. I'm, look forward to telling you today a little bit about the work that we're doing in ASTM and how that's going to support certification of orbs and of uh, eVTOL 
and how we hope that it's going to make uh, aviation safer and also um, just you know bring us into the next age of aviation. So if you go to the first slide, the, the benefits of autonomy, you know, both the civil folks and really smart folks in the civil world and uh, really smart folks in the military world have, have looked at this. Um, on the civil side, the national academies have said, you know, really we have the opportunity to use autonomy to um, improve safety by responding to, to unanticipated environments and using processing speed and AI to, to solve that and improve safety for, for civil aviation. On military, you know, the military folks have looked at it and they've said, you know, it's got a lot of value. It can bring us new missions. It can adapt um, and it can, uh, it can improve our speed. And that's something that's going to be so critical for our military. So, um, you know, I, I'm probably preaching to the choir here, but, you know, we've got a lot of benefits of autonomy that autonomy can bring to aviation. Next slide. So what, what we're doing in ASTM is we really have four fundamental aviation standards group. Uh, we have F-37 on light sport aircraft, F-38 on unmanned aircraft systems, F-39 on aircraft systems like avionics, and F-44 on general aviation. Um, these four groups, these four committees, produce standards that can be used under Part 23 and Part 21 to support certification of orbs of, of UAM. Um, in fact, a lot of the companies that we heard from this week are looking at Part 23 as the way forward for uh, certification, for type certification of their aircraft. What we do in AC 377, we don't write standards, but we try and harmonize our terminology, our requirements, our fundamental technological pillars and regulatory barriers across the four committees such that the standards can be reused. So one thing I see Andy Thurling's on, Andy just led an effort with an F-38 um, on a detect and avoid standard. And that has a lot of assumptions built into it for unmanned aircraft systems. Well, wouldn't it be great if we could take some of that technology that and some of the the standards, the requirements, and the means of compliance in that standard, and maybe use it in a different context for light sport aircraft, where it provides the pilot more situation awareness. Um, you know, we can we can do that. So AC three seven seven looks to help coordinate that across the committees and uh, by using common requirements, terminology, design pillars, and regulatory uh, understanding. Next slide. We've produced a technical report um, called Terminology and Requirements Framework. Uh, this was led by Andy Latcher and Anna Dietrich. Um, this report defines 51 terms related to aviation autonomy. So an important thing of reusing standards is going to be using common words that mean the same thing. Um, another, another really important thing is a requirements framework, which I'll get into here in a minute about how we look at it. Now, we, we looked at levels of autonomy similar to what the automotive industry had done, and we just found that it wasn't a good fit for aviation. You know, one of the reasons is, is that some of the pilot's tasks, uh, like communicating with ATC, are at a very low level uh, of autonomy, whereas things like autopilots and fly-by-wire systems are at a very high level autonomy. And sometimes those tasks mix to the point that it's very difficult to define a single level of autonomy that relates to those things. So we instead are recommending this requirements framework, which I'll talk here about in a couple seconds. And then finally, the other thing too is, is taking a look, uh, and hopefully Carl Dietrich will talk about this later, uh, at the, the functions of a pilot, what the pilot does for the aircraft and decomposing them. And then once we decompose those functions, we can run them through the framework and see for an automated function, what the requirements need to be and what the required rigor and the evidence to support certification for those requirements needs to be. Next. So the first step again is that functional decomposition. We include a couple of examples in our technical report. Um, the first question we ask is, well, what's the intended function? What, what is the actual thing that, is, that we're trying to do that's being automated? And then what are the roles of the machine and the human? Um, maybe in some cases, 
it's going from uh, a human actuate role to a human monitor role. So understanding that and understanding the differences in, in the, what that is going to do for the pilot display and, and, and um, integration with the system is going to mean. And then what happens in off-nominal conditions? What happens when the automation just doesn't work? Does it dump it back in the pilot's lap? Is there a fail safe? Is there a monitoring function that kicks in? So understanding that is real important of running it through this requirements framework. Next. So after you've decomposed, uh, you've identified the function and task, the first thing we're going to look at are the risks and benefits. So um, it could be that we're asking the automation to take over a very, very important function, but the risk of leaving it off the aircraft um, actually outweigh, or, or yeah, the, the benefit of putting it on the aircraft outweighs the risk of putting it on at a lower level of rigor. So for example, the F-16 ground collision avoidance system, um, it kicks in at only in emergency conditions when it th thinks that the pilot is either not paying attention or has been incapacitated. It is not at the highest level of certification, but the benefit that it provides is pro it's saved 10 lives so far. So having that on the airplane is better than not having it on at all. Uh, so we look at the risks and the benefits. We, um, we also look at the role of automation. Like I mentioned, are we changing the way that the pilot is gonna interact with the vehicle now? And what does that mean for our standard and our means of compliance? And then finally, what's the level of maturity of the technology that we're leveraging? Is it something brand new that's never been done before? If so, you're probably gonna really need to prove it out to the regulator that this technology is mature and safe. If it's something that's been around for 30 or 40 years that we're just applying in a new way, maybe we can take credit for that and, um, and, and put in requirements that are consistent with that level of maturity. What, you, what we end up after we go through this requirements framework for automation is a set of tailable requirements and means of compliance that matches how that automation is being used to fulfill that role that we started off with at the top. Next slide. We have another technical report that's coming out later this summer. It's called um, Developmental Pillars for Increased Autonomy for Aircraft Systems. What we did here is we realized that we have an aging workforce, and so a lot of the lessons that have been learned at NASA Dryden and NASA, and NASA Ames and through the Air Force and the Navy and others are kind of being lost. And we also have a lot of new entrants coming into aviation for the first time that are maybe non-traditional. They didn't grow up in the, in the aviation world. And so we want to make sure that we've got a good primer that we can give to people and say, hey, this is really how we, in the past, we have the lessons learned of implementing automation on, on aircraft. Uh, we also want to make sure that our standards committees um, are dealing with all six of these pillars. And you can see them listed on board. Uh, modularity and partitioning, runtime assurance, fail functionality, dynamic consistency checking, making sure that the inputs coming into the automation are, are dynamically consistent. They're not, uh, you're not going from flying 180 knots to, to 18,000 knots in a second, which just is not possible. So we know that the automation doesn't accept that as truth. Um, looking at the role of the human, and then looking at development assurance, looking at the things that we do in our requirements and our level of rigor of testing and, and tracing um, to make sure that it matches the, the level of rigor required for the intended function. Next. And then the last area that we're looking at, um, um, by the way, that, that work was led by Dr. Lloyd Hook out of University of Tulsa, the, the development pillars. This regulatory uh, barrier analysis is being led by um, uh, Anna Dietrich and Dave Stevens from Joby, uh, Wes Ryan as well from the FAA has really been contributing in all these areas. Um, and what we're looking at particularly here is um, 3,171 lines of, of Part 91. And so we've, we've said, okay, let's take a look at the current code of federal, federal regulations, rules of the air, and say, if we put an automated system in, and take some of that functionality that was traditionally performed by a human pilot in command, 
how close is it going to be to complying with the rules of the air? And the good news is, is what we found is that most of the time there's no conflict, but we have found a few areas where the, the, the regulation is either going to need some tweaking, it's going to slow the process, or it could even present a large barrier to, to automation and autonomy. So what we're doing right now is we're writing a white paper, writing a technical report that's going to identify what these are and then present some options for how we might deal with them going forward. So that's an important aspect, again, that we're informing our standards committees on and we're making sure that they're aware of these so we can work together to, 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 to address them. Uh, next slide. So in conclusion, um, you know, I know, I, I mean, you're here at Agility Prime, so um, you already know that autonomy and automation has the potential to transform aviation and uh, make it safer, um, make it uh, provide more missions, uh, really unlock the, the next age of, of aviation. Um, and, you know, we think that consensus standard bodies like ASTM um, can provide consensus standards that can keep up with the pace of technology and uh, again, support that Part 23 or that Part 21 certification uh, from the FAA. We think common terminology and harmonized requirements frameworks are really critical to producing consistent standards and understanding why the level of rigor proposed is what it is. Um, we think that foundational technologies that we're capturing in the developmental pillars of autonomy are really important for the entire community to understand. And finally, we're also looking at the regulatory barriers and, and looking at ways of addressing those. So um, again, you know, working together, we feel in, in a standards group, we feel like we can um, move aviation into the age of autonomy. And with that, I'll be happy to take your questions. Great, thank you very much. Uh, so we do have a few questions. People are, are posting them in chat. So if you have a question, please, please type it in there. Um, the first one is Northrop has world-class autonomy technology. Why isn't Northrop more interested in using this great technology in the eVTOL commercial slash commercial drone market? Well, I appreciate that, that compliment. And yes, I agree that we do have world-class technology. And I think that, um, you know, one of the things that, that we're really uh, interested in and really really been paying a lot of attention to this week is just what the Air Force is doing here with Agility Prime and and looking to see you know what the the different opportunities are so um, I'm not going to comment on any particular um, angle or strategy that we might be pursuing but certainly the fact that the Air Force is um, is, is looking at this and has organized this conference uh, says a lot. And then another one, uh, will we need some kind of predefined protocol for the communication of different types of vehicles, UAS, UAM? Is ASTM looking at anything like that? Yeah, we are. Um, so within, uh, I, I think I focused a lot here kind of more on the vehicle side and the airworthiness side, but within uh, F-38, we have an entire um, operations subcommittee that is producing things like remote identification requirements, uh, standards for, for unmanned aircraft systems, uh, UTM uh, requirements, um, uh, looking at the whole traffic management aspect of it. And so again, that's, a, that's another area where, you know, our, we're really focusing mostly on UAS, unmanned aircraft systems, but, you know, using this connection between our four aviation committees that might be a way that we could leverage that and um, be able to, to, to use it for, for urban air mobility or, or other types of applications. Okay, great. Um, so when evaluating the role of um, human, uh, sorry, when evaluating the role of human and the role of machine for particular functions, how do you determine which has the ultimate authority? Can the pilot overturn machine decisions and or vice versa? Yeah, that's one of the questions that we look at in the framework, right? And so when you're looking at a level of rigor or you're looking at the means of compliance for a specific architecture or implementation of that autonomy, that is one of the key questions you have to ask. And so, um, you know, one is, uh, 
you know, one of the concepts that we've looked at is um, we have an ASTM standard called F F3269, where there's actually a safety monitor independent from the automation that can override and, and outvote the automation per se and return it to either a safe state that the pilot can manage or put the vehicle in some sort of predefined safe state um, that, you know, that, that we that we've defined. So that is a good approach. Um, and that's something that we consider in that requirements framework. Great. Um, okay, this is asking your opinion. So it seems like for eVTOL as a autonomy evolves that a hybrid approach with a first safety pilot like involvement on board to an approach where a pilot in the loop but at a ground station can get involved in off nominal or emergency situations as a manual reversionary backup for multiple vehicle controls until the equivalent Monte Carlo-like data is available to fully trust autonomy alone. Yeah, that's, um, that, so my opinion on that is that um, I think that we certainly should look at a crawl, walk, run approach. Um, similar, if you look at how the auto, automotive industry has approached automation, that's kind of what, what they've done. You know, they add, you know, a little bit here and then they add a parallel automatic parallel parking feature and then they do it. So they're constantly getting the human, getting the driver more and more comfortable with, with the automation. Um, one thing I think we have to be really careful of is not putting the pilot or the whoever's responsible for the safety in a situation where the automation is just going to dump something in their lap. Um, and so there's got to be that, that, means of maintain if we are going to ask for a human backup there's got to be a way of maintaining that situation awareness back to the person responsible for safety otherwise it puts them in a very difficult and, and um, position and that's that second pillar of that requirements framework that i talked about and we talk a lot about more of that in the in the report okay. The ASTM definition of autonomy for aerospace is not as simple as the one defined by SAE for automotive. How do we simplify for laymen? Yeah, I mean, this is kind of the age old question and there's a, there's a, you know, there's certainly a group of folks that say we should even stop using uh, the word autonomy to begin with, because it seems like it always means the next thing that we haven't been able to do yet. And then as soon as we are able to do it, then the next harder thing becomes what we mean by autonomous. Um, I, I would just say, you know, to the questioner, you know, I, if you'll contact me offline, I'd be happy to talk with you about how we harmonize definitions. Um, I'd love to see that happen across the community. Um, really, the technical report from our perspective was, was really, you know, having a couple of, first one was for our standards committees to all be on the same page so we can reuse each other's standards. So, that was the first one. And the second one was really just saying, hey, here's kind of our input into the broader conversation. And we realize that there's a lot of stakeholders, not just domestically, but internationally. So we're, we'd love to, to continue to talk and, and have more conversations on that. Great. How does ASTM plan to work with the Agility Prime program? Great question. Um, wow, that's a really good one. I think, you know, this is our starting point, to be honest, you know, is uh, we were, Agility Prime was kind enough to, to ask us to, to speak today. And um, certainly, you know, we've been working in different forums on the F44 side. A lot of the folks that are making these vehicles are participating in that. Um, so certainly there's a connection there. I think um, also we're just really interested in, um, in seeing how this all develops. Um, you know, we, uh, ASTM, our standards are used both on the civil side to support Part 23 and Part 21, but they're also used on the military side in Milham Book 516. So, um, you know, we're still going to be exploring that space, but this is really the first um, of step of our relationship we're really excited to be presenting here today. Great. Uh, is ASTM working on standards for AI machine learning capable uh, systems? Not specifically, at least at least not that I'm aware of. Um, now, there are some robotics committees in ASTM that are not specifically um, they're not specifically aviation committees. So 
I should, ASTM is a huge, huge organization. And so I can only really talk about the little tiny piece that, that I know about. So there could be some folks in the robotics community that actually are working on that standard. But from an aviation perspective, we've taken kind of a different uh, approach on that F3269 standard where we've said, listen, some of these technologies that are being proposed are just too complex to come up, or at least we don't know how right now to come up with a way of certifying their non-deterministic behavior. So what we're gonna do instead is, is like let that, we're gonna turn the toddler loose in the room, but we're gonna plug all the outlets and we're gonna put the cage around, or not the cage, but the, the <laughs> child gate, the child gate around it. Um, and we're going to you know, make sure that, that, that there's freedom and we're not exactly sure what that toddler is gonna do, but we do know the bounds and we have to find safe bounds for that behavior. And that's really the approach that, um, that we're using in the F3269 standard is saying, let's let a complex function onto the aircraft that's not pedigreed we don't have that certification evidence but we have put in safeguards and recovery functions around it and that's what we believe is going to be a good path for getting that technology on our aircraft right um yeah working from home long enough toddlers and cages start to go together it makes sense <laughs> yeah too, too much tiger king so, yeah. sorry about that Okay, great. Well, thank you so much. Um, and thanks everyone for their questions. Um, our session is coming to a close now. So you can go back to agilityprime.com and watch the live session now. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thanks everyone for joining.